It's my pleasure to introduce Michael Wara. Uh, Michael's a, a lawyer and scholar focused on climate and energy policy. He's a senior research scholar at the Woods Institute for the Environment and director of the Climate and Energy Policy Program. The program provides fact-based, bipartisan, technical, and legal assistance to policymakers engaged in the development of novel climate and energy law and regulation. His legal and policy work focuses on carbon pricing, energy innovation, and reg regulated industries. And he was also one of five members of Governor Newsom's Wildfire Commission, is a Marin resident, and was a Stanford Law School alum. Um, so tonight he'll be discussing what is causing the increased incidence of wildfires in our states, local and state policies that can counteract this trend, the forces that are preventing good policies from getting passed, and how our energy infrastructure might evolve as a result in the years to come. So please join me in welcoming Michael. Thank you very much for having me. I'm going to talk about wildfire in Northern California. And as, as Michael mentioned, I'm a Mill Valley resident. And so this is something, you know, I, I am living this along with all of you and lived through um, the experiences of the last several years, which have been, I think, really shocking for all of us. Um, I came to this problem because of my longstanding interest and participation in policymaking in California in the energy space. And as of course, all of us know, the wildfires of the last several years have been caused by Pacific Gas and Electric infrastructure or the most destructive and deadly wildfires have been caused by that infrastructure. And so um, I was drawn into the issue of wildfire um, about three years ago, um, but I've long been interested in it as a Marin resident because it is really, you know, one of, we've known for a long time that wildfire was going to become worse due to the effects of climate change. And I actually gave a talk to Marin alumni about, gosh, it might have been about 10 years ago now, and where I really, you know, talked about sea level rise as something that we should all be concerned about, but focused on the threat from wildfire as kind of a key impact that Marin in particular would likely feel um, under the you know, likely scenarios playing out with respect to climate change. And you know, unfortunately, uh, here we are and we're having to learn how to cope with that and maybe address some challenges that we could have gotten away with not addressing before, but now we are forced to deal with it. Um, so I'll just begin by noting a few of the impacts of wildfire, um, some of which are pretty obvious and some of which maybe are less obvious. Um, you know, the fundamental problem is that the current system for managing um, risks of wildfire and also for allocating the losses from wildfire in California is unsustainable. It's, it's first of all, unsafe for people and communities. You know, Santa Rosa was devastated by the wildfires of 2017. The people of Paradise and more generally of Butte County were devastated by what occurred there in uh, 2018. And we cannot afford as a state, particularly a state in the midst of a punishing housing crisis, to lose thousands of structures, thousands of residences every year. And so it's, it's just unacceptable and we need to figure out a better way to manage this problem. In addition, and perhaps less obvious, wildfire smoke is becoming maybe one of the most significant air quality issues in California. For 50 years, we have been a leader in reducing air pollution, first starting with carbon monoxide from cars, lead from cars, and, and more recently particulate matter and ozone. But the particulates from smoke and the ozone caused by smoke are undoing many of the air quality improvements that we've achieved over the last several decades and are sickening and killing large numbers of people in California. In addition, and I'm sure some of you have experienced this, we've definitely dealt with some of the impacts of this, there are significant homeowner impacts because of the increased risk of wildfire and the, the perception of that risk um, for homes that are in what's called the wildland urban interface, but you can think of most of Marin County um, as being in that zone. Um, because of the property loss, and also, more generally, because of rising insurance costs, as insurers get more nervous about writing coverage for homes in higher risk areas, the costs rise for everyone. And some people are finding that insurance is even unavailable, or the products that are available are exotic and extremely expensive. Um, in addition, and, and we haven't really yet seen this, but we will, I can assure you, 
um, there are large electricity ratepayer impacts from wildfire that are going to be sort of filtering into rates. The, the electricity sort of system and regulatory system works very slowly so that the 2017 costs of wildfire are really just starting to be felt. Um, um, and, and the subsequent investments that PG&E has made to shore up their system are just beginning to be felt in rates, but that impact is gonna grow. And in addition to that, of course, um, you know, we, we are in the midst of the pg and &E bankruptcy, hopefully nearing its end, but bankruptcies are incredibly expensive processes. And guess who's gonna pay for this one? The ratepayers of Northern California. So there are, there are significant energy system costs that we ultimately bear. And that's particularly important as we enter an economic recession, hopefully not a depression, but a severe recession where for low income Californians, energy costs become significant burden. Um, in addition, and I personally find this issue important as well, um, the impacts on our utilities of wildfire, the impacts on their financial viability, um, and, and I'll get to kind of responsibility for that in a minute, but the, whatever the cause, weak utilities threaten our ability to achieve our energy and climate goals as well. We have relied on our utilities for a lot of the success that we've had in implementing clean electricity standards in California, known as the Renewable Portfolio Standard. And we have assumed that we can continue to rely on those companies to kind of um, provide stable financing conditions for all of the wind turbines and solar power plants that are driving a transition from carbon intensive electricity to clean electricity, which hopefully someday will also charge more of our vehicles and power more of the energy uses that we, um, that we need in our homes, like, like heating and cooling and cooking. But if the utilities are sick because of wildfire, it's gonna be much more difficult to achieve those goals as well. It's worth noting, you know, and I've been talking about a lot about electric utilities already, wildfires have many causes. Um, and depending on how you look at the problem, certain causes can seem more important or less important. These are two kind of two pie charts. One shows the acres burned in the top 21 most destructive fires in California. And if you look at that chart, you can see that um, electrical or suspected electrical causes drove about um, you know, more than half the losses, but there's a significant other um, set of causes related to human, human impacts. And it's, it's fair to say that humans tend to start the most destructive fires. The Rim Fire in Yosemite was started by some hunters that didn't extinguish their campfire. That was one of the largest fires ever in California history. Um, but if you focus instead on structures destroyed, and that's the figure on the right, the electricity system really jumps out of, of the picture, right? Close to three quarters of structures lost in the most destructive fires are due to problems with the electricity system. And so this really points to kind of the, the, the challenge that's ahead as the impacts of fires grow because of climate change, we need to address ignitions in the electricity system that used to be sometimes a nuisance. Some of you who hike um, on Diaz Ridge in Southern Marin County may have noticed that there was a fire um, uh, on the very summit of, of the ridge um, by Panoramic Highway last year. It was ignited by a transformer that blew up and was quickly extinguished by the fire department. That was the typical electricity utility related ignition of the past. But today, um, there are much greater consequences for mistakes, faults in the system. Mis you know, consequences like what occurred in Napa and Sonoma in October of 2017, or in Butte County in November of 2017, or last year, sorry, 2018, or last year, um, when a transmission line failed at the geysers and ignited the Kincaid fire. So, we're really, um, we're really facing a different environment that is much less fault tolerant and we need to address that in order to address the most destructive fires if what you care about are communities, right? Our homes burning down as opposed to trees, acreage burning down. There are many fires that are started by lightning, 
that are started by other human causes, you know, things that are more familiar from kind of Smokey the Bear advertising that will not be solved by dealing with the power system. But those fires do not tend to burn down houses. They tend to burn down large acreage and they tend to burn down lots of trees. They have large ecosystem impacts, which are important and need to be addressed, but they are not um, typically the fires that cause the most havoc for our communities. Um, so how have utilities responded to the wildfire crisis? I think you, to, to really think about this, you need to look south to San Diego Gas and Electric and the experience of San Diego. The picture shows a, fi a fire called the Witch Fire that burned in 2007 in San Diego County. And it really caused a total reevaluation of how San Diego Gas and Electric operated its system. Um, it burned down over a thousand homes and burned out of the mountains and really into kind of what San Diegans prior to that had thought of as kind of safe parts of the, parts of the area, big subdivisions, you know, cul-de-sacs, things like that. And um, after the fire, the utility really worried that if something like that ever happened again, it would lose its social license to operate. It would be stripped of its monopoly. Who knows what other kinds of consequences might befall it. So they adopted a, um, an approach where they started to begin to quantify their risk and, and risk outcomes. So they, they really started trying to measure what the risk was of an ignition or of a fire at any particular spot in their system. And they began a system of gradually trying to improve their system, um, you know, improve, measure risk, improve, measure risk. And they did that by deploying weather stations all over their system, by breaking their system into smaller chunks, by installing lots of sensors, and also by, and, and San Diego is really the originator of this, by turning the power off using public safety power shutoffs during particularly dangerous events. They also, in order to justify both the expense and the customer impacts of all of this, did a ton of community outreach, both with local elected officials and also just with the customers that were gonna be most impacted. Now, it's important to emphasize, San Diego was able to do this in part because a number of factors make it easier than it's going to be where we live in Northern California. There's a lot fewer trees in Southern California. Trees are a big risk, as I'll talk about in a minute. There's also um, a lot fewer people that live in the high risk areas in San Diego County. The high risk areas in the picture, you can see the fires are coming out of the mountains and burning down toward the ocean. And not very many people live in that mountainous, hot, dry terrain in San Diego County, which meant that fewer people were impacted when the power had to be shut off. So the PG&E challenge where we live is very different. There's a lot of trees. There's also a much older electricity system. PG&E was, the PG&E system was largely built in the early 20th century. And we are really struggling with the consequences of that today. Nobody lived in San Diego at that time. And most of the population growth in San Diego, it has come since the 1980s. Um, there's also a much lower level of undergrounding. So most of our wires are on poles, whereas in newer electricity systems, wires tend to be placed underground. Um, in addition, as everyone knows who lives in Northern California and no doubt appreciates, we have a much more geographically diverse service territory. pg e system is much larger and it covers really different kinds of terrain and areas and different weather environments. Finally, there got, there's a lot of people, 17 million people live in pg e service area. So keeping more people out of harm's way creates additional challenges. Because there are more trees, there are also greater challenges with tree trimming. I live in Mill Valley because it's beautiful and it's a wonderful place to raise children where they can be outdoors and in nature. And part of that nature is the beautiful trees that exist in our community. It is challenging for the tree trimmers that want to come in to do a good job, to do a job that creates safety and also doesn't really raise the ire of the neighborhoods in which they work through. And I'm sure anyone who's been living in Marin and observing the very kind of dramatic actions being taken by the tree trimmers when they do show up um, will, will know what I'm talking about. They are not always artists when they come to trim your tree that happens to be near a power pole. And the reality is that there are many trees that are 
far enough away from the power lines that PG&E doesn't have a legal right to trim them, but which still pose a ton of risk, particularly during high winds to those power lines and consequently to fire risk. Most of the fires that started in the Napa and Sonoma area in October of 2017 during the fire siege there were caused by tree limbs that blew from outside. It was called the utility line easement, the area where PG&E has authority to trim trees that blew from outside the easement into the easement and hit the conductors, the wires, and knocked them on the ground starting fires. That's a hard problem to deal with, um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge. In addition, um, the reality is that even if we wanted to throw infinite money and, um, and uh, um, were willing to allow tree trimming to occur wherever it needed to, there are real limitations on skilled labor. You can't just send anybody up into a tree above a live power line and have them trimming large limbs. The trimmers that work on these trees uh, in these contexts need to be very skilled and PG&E and Southern California Edison have essentially hired every available arborist who meets the qualifications in the country and are driving up the salaries of arborists nationwide because of their need to basically catch up on their tree trimming. That limits how fast we can progress. And that's going to be important as I talk about um, things moving forward. The other issue that's also very important in the PG&E service territory is the fact that the very large high voltage lines, these are the tall, the, the lines that are put on tall metal towers um, that have higher voltages than the line that's connected to your house. Um, they have also been an important source of wildfires. In particular, the campfire was started by a 115 kilovolt line that had been placed um, in the early 20th century to connect San Francisco to the Feather River hydro system. Um, the Kincaid fire, which was the big fire last year in Sonoma County, was started by a line that was built in the 1960s to connect the geysers to the backbone of the California electric power system. You know, the geysers have a large uh, geothermal power plant um, located there. And um, the, the unfortunate reality is that the PG&E transmission system is really old. It was built in two large kind of pulses first in the 1920s as the state really electrified and moved from, from wood and, and kerosene to electricity as a fuel for energy in homes. And then after World War II, as the population of California grew rapidly. But the newest transmission in much of the PG&E service territory was built before 1980. So it's getting old and it's starting to fail. Um, and so the, the implication there again is significant investment in order to bring the system up to snuff to make it safe. And this is occurring in a context where we can't afford to make mistakes. We cannot afford to have any, any system components fail during these dangerous moments when, um, when, uh, when a single spark could cause devastation to a community. Um, lastly, I would just say, Obviously, the company's bankrupt, and the, the incentives created by bankruptcy are not always good. They tend to focus on the short term and to create um, you know, uh, incentives, especially for, the, for the, comp the hedge funds that currently own the company um, that are relatively short term as opposed to the long term incentives that we as a state and as customers and residents, customers of PG&E and residents of Northern California desperately want the utility to, to be motivated by. And so the, the regulators, the California Public Utility Commission and Governor Newsom face an enormous challenge pushing the company to really think long-term so that they're making the smart investments now, even if it's not in their short run financial interest to do so. Um, so an additional thing worth mentioning before I get into what we need to do is just that electricity rates in California are very high. And they're high, especially where these wildfire related investments have been happening for a while. You can see in this chart that the orange bar is San Diego's cost per unit of electricity. And it pops up above the other two, PG&E and Edison, right in 2013 and up to the present. And that's because of the phase in of these big investments in safety after that witch fire, the, the picture which I showed you earlier. 
affordability is a huge challenge in California. And we need to keep an eye on that and keep an eye on it, especially for low income customers as we make these investments. So what do we do? What's the response? What, what's, what's a reasonable response to this? I think it's really a four part response. One is we need to do what's called grid hardening. We need to, we need to reduce the risk of bits and pieces of our power set system failing in ways that cause fires during high risk times of, times of the year. We also need to invest a lot more in reducing the consequences of error, right? Reducing the chance that homes burn down once a wildfire starts. And I'll tell you, we're doing a lot more of the first thing than we are of the second thing. As a state um, and, and as a community, Marin voted narrowly to approve really a, a unique um, measure in the last election cycle that would fund a lot of um, wildfire preparedness. So we're, we're ahead of the game as a county, but we have a lot of work to do. Um, all of that work, grid hardening and preparation of our communities takes time. It's going to take a long time, actually, probably a decade to get where we need to be. In the meantime, unfortunately, power shutoffs are also likely a part of the solution. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So if they are a part of the solution, I think we also need to be thinking hard about how it can reduce their impacts. We need to make sure that all of the critical infrastructure in our communities has backup generation, and we need to help normal people get backup generation, either from solar panels and batteries or from diesel generators so that their lives can be, you know, they can maintain some semblance of normalcy during these times when the overhead wires are just not safe to operate as we improve uh, the system. I should just say, that's a picture of the Mill Valley uh, fire from 1929. You know, that's the fire that I fear, um, and I hope that we can avoid um, a similar outcome because were it to occur today, the level of destruction would really be just untold. Um, so how do we respond to the wildfire challenge? One thing we need to do is we need to make our grid better. We've underinvested in the grid over the last several decades, and that needs to change. And it has, it is changing, and it's changing quickly. Um, the most important change, I could go through a lot of detail, but the most important change, I think, is one of a sort of a, a change in philosophy about how we manage this big, basically, machine that supplies us with electrical energy. Um, historically, utilities and utilities almost everywhere else in the world run their grids with a philosophy of what they call run to condition. And what that really means is run to failure. You run the system until a piece breaks, you show up with your utility truck, you replace that piece, you turn the power back on, off to the races. That's a very cost effective option, except if when that piece fails, you burn down the community that you intend to serve. So utilities need to change fundamentally how they, they work and, and really engage in preventative maintenance and, and with a much more kind of um, risk-based preventative approach to maintaining and operating the grid. In the utility space, the best example of this kind of approach and this shift in thinking occurred in the nuclear power industry after Three Mile Island. Up until TMI, the nuclear power plants in this country were run to failure. And that's a really bad way to run a power plant that inside it has a nuclear reactor. After TMI, changes were made and the operational history of nuclear units in this country is actually quite good after TMI. Um, commercial aircraft are another example where you know, many of the parts in a commercial aircraft, and especially in commercial aircraft engines, are replaced on a cycle and are not allowed to fail because failure is unacceptable. The, you know, a failure of an engine or a key component on an aircraft is going to kill hundreds of people and scare people away from flying. And so the industry has adapted. But I would just emphasize, this is cultural change. It's not necessarily installing a particular kind of hardware or making sure that you have, you know, the newest gear up on a pole. It's changing the approach of the people in the field from one of fix it when it breaks to measurement and understanding of the characteristics of a system that occur before it fails so that you can engage and fix problems before they even occur. And that takes time. I would say that my observations at PG&E is that this is starting to happen, but we have a long way to go and down this road. Um, so encouraging early signs, 
but the proof will be in the pudding in the years to come. Um, in addition, we had one year where Bambi was the um, spokesperson for the U.S. Forest Service uh, fire um, fire uh, uh, campaigns, and I, I wish they they kept her because she's pretty awesome. Um, so. Another thing we need to do is we just need to reduce the consequences of error, like ignitions whenever they occur, from lightning, from arson, from campers who don't put out their fires, and most importantly from utilities, um, need to have um, you know, outcomes where fewer structures burn down. And we, there is science about how to do this. Um, probably the most important thing that needs to happen is that the building envelope, the outsides of homes, needs to be hardened. And there are many homes in Marin County that are not hardened, and there are some built after 2009 that are. You know, there are key changes, some of them simple and low cost that homeowners can make, and some that are pretty expensive and hard to do. Um, but the evidence that's emerging from the last several fire seasons where we have large numbers of homes that burned down and also large numbers of homes that survived in the, in the fire footprints tells us that hardening the building envelope is incredibly important. In addition, and this has been enormously controversial in Mill Valley where I live, creating a non-combustible zone around homes, a five foot zone where there's nothing that can burn is incredibly important for creating safety. That is just a clear message that is coming out of the last three years of losses of structures in Northern California. The reason for that is that what happens in these big fires is that embers are flying through the air, sometimes from as far away as a mile. And they, they run into a house, they hit the wall of a house in the wind and fall down into its base. If the home has combustible material where that ember hits the ground, it will ignite the material. If it does not, and, and usually then ignite the home. If it does not, the ember hits the ground and burns out and there's no consequence. And you see a really stark difference in the survivorship of homes that had non-combustible zones prior to big fires and homes that didn't. In addition, there are sort of larger um, fuels management issues that loom large for Marin County. Um, we need to create better defensible space around our homes and, um, and also engage in what's what I would call community scale fuels management, right? Building fire breaks so that big fires can't spread um, too far in, in, in high winds. So there's been a lot of effort on this front, for example, um, near where I live up on Blythdale Ridge where the, the various land managers have really tried to create a fuel break that would hopefully prevent a fire from crossing the ridge. We need much more of that approach. And ideally, and this is a long run goal, but the, the foresters who know most about this would say that we need to get to a place with our forests where we can actually reintroduce prescribed fire to our forests. And that will happen only after we've done extensive fuels management because we haven't really been doing the fuels management for the better part of a century and the fuels have been growing in and getting denser and more, more concentrated. So that now fires are explosive as opposed to kind of smaller and more contained um, and more containable. And I think the thing, the thing that's most challenging about all of this is that um, none of these strategies really work in isolation. You know, one homeowner hardening their home doesn't do the trick, right? What you need to create is herd immunity for a community. If all the homes or a substantial fraction of the homes are hardened and have non-combustible zones, then the neighborhood will not burn. Because the reality is that, especially in um, uh, neighborhoods that were built, um, well, actually, I, I, many, in many neighborhoods in, in Marin, the, the homes themselves are the fuel. So once you ignite, you know, once you ignite one house, the houses tend to burn down kind of like dominoes, right, would fall in a stack. And because the house contains so much energy as it burns, it releases a tremendous amount of heat and it will ignite the home next to it. And then that home will ignite the home next to it. And so the way you break that chain of causation is you have many homes that have been hardened and have not combustible zones, and you have defensible space around many of the properties, enough to kind of reduce the intensity of energy release as the fire propagates through a community. Um, what that means is that we need to focus on equity and make sure that there are programs to help the people who don't have you know, sufficient income or cash flow coming into their life 
to make the kinds of changes that will make the entire community safe. This is not a kind of, this is not something that everyone can accomplish on their own. We need to all work together to create safety at the community level so that we're safe when, you know, there's a, there's a careless teenager that accidentally sets a fire and we're also safe so that when a line, uh, one of PG&E's lines or someone else's um, power line gets knocked down by a tree, we don't lose 5,000 homes as occurred uh, in the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa. So all of that is, a, it's a lot of work and it's gonna take time. And um, this is just an early electricity cost fire, I should just say, this is the 1923 Berkeley fire. It burned out of the, uh, one of the canyons above UC Berkeley and burned all the way to Hearst. That's why when you go to North Berkeley, there are very few wood shingle homes and a lot more stucco homes. Whereas in the, the area south of campus, there's a lot more wood shingle um, still left in the neighborhood. Um, power line fires have been around for a long time. They're very destructive. Uh, the reality is that we cannot do all of the things we need to do to make our community safe from power line fires on the time scale of a single year or even multiple years. And that means that public safety power shutoffs are likely to be with us for the, for the time being. And it may even be that they're with us for the foreseeable future because climate change will make the conditions so much more intense. Um, the, the, the key challenge and the thing that all of the utilities in California need to be doing is making these blackouts more surgical, right? How we need to make sure that we're turning off only the customers that we need to turn off because there's no way to make the power system safe where they live and not turning off customers that, um, that are not in high risk areas. The problem is that the grid was not built with wildfire safety in mind. It was built to be cheap, right? As cheap to construct as possible so that customers would have lower bills. So many of the circuits that serve our houses, you know, cross from low risk areas into high risk areas. So you can have a, you know, a circuit that's serving part of downtown San Rafael that then goes up on the ridge above downtown San Rafael. Ideally, you'd have two circuits so that you could leave the downtown on and turn off the ridge during a high wind event in the fall. We don't have that yet, um, but we need to move in that direction. And a key issue that we should all be thinking about is sort of how far can we go in that direction and what will be left over, right? Where, where are the places where we should really think about maybe undergrounding or getting backup generation? And this moves to kind of the next question. Or, well, I should just say, um, you know, one thing to say about uh, PSPS and, and public safety power shutoffs is just that um, they're hard to do well. And this kind of surgical approach is easier to say, uh, you know, to speak about in concept, harder to execute in practice. You know, you may remember that there were 800,000 people in the dark and then the Kincaid fire was ignited. That's because PG&E didn't turn off all of its system. It tried to leave some of it on. Um, at the same time, it is fair to say that that event, that, that blackout um, allowed for all firefighting elements in Northern California to focus on a single fire and not be sort of diluted out as occurred in the 2017 wildfires. Um, there's also after action reports from many of the, the, the PSPS that indicate that fires were prevented. You know, we do not have a system that's safe right now as much as we should and, and, and deserve to have that system. And so this kind of activity is important. Um, there are very difficult decisions coming, particularly this year, about how much to use this tool. Um, and we need to think about this, you know, much in the way we've learned to think about testing for COVID, right? What are the risks of false positives where we, um, we turn off the power when we didn't need to, right? And it didn't turn out to be dangerous. What are also the risks of false negatives? where we don't turn off the power, but we should have, and then a fire ensues. And so balancing those false positives versus false negatives is the real practical work of deciding which homes will be blacked out during times of high risk right now. And it's a very difficult decision. My bias would be that the people with the most information and the best information should be making it, and we should try to depoliticize it as much as possible, but you know, I'm just one person and, um, and many people suffer 
very, you know, very significant impacts from these, from these blackouts. And I understand why they would prefer them to happen less. So my view has been for a while that if these blackouts were a reality, we need to have a much more serious effort aimed at mitigating their impacts. Um, and that means helping people get backup power who really need it and who otherwise can't afford it. In my neighborhood, after the first power shut off in October, it was very quiet. During the second power shut off, you could hardly sleep at night because so many people had bought That's something that relatively well-off people can afford to do. It's much less achievable for people who have low in, low or fixed incomes. And it can be important, critically important, for people that have medical devices in their homes. So we need to make sure that we're helping the people that need help and can't afford to help themselves. We also need to make sure that small town business districts are not put out of business by these power shutoffs. They were incredibly impactful on many small town business districts, in, um, especially in the Sierra and Gold Country during October. And if it's the long run, it's gonna have big impacts on the viability of many of the businesses that help keep these communities intact and thriving. So there's a major challenge here for rethinking how we help customers be resilient to these blackouts and how we pay for that and how we pay for that for low income people. The governor has made some initial efforts at this that I think are really admirable and we're learning a lot from those initial attempts to provide backup power to critical infrastructure, to medical baseline customers, and also to small town business districts. But we've got a long ways to go and I think a lot more investment to think about making. So in summary, I think there are these four big steps we should be thinking about taking and, and, and to some degree are taking. If you ask me where we have the biggest challenge, it's in number two. We're not doing nearly enough to, to lower the intensity of fire once it starts. And we really need to be thinking hard about how to increase our level of investment in that. And also, excuse me, and also our, our level of, of um, public acceptance of you know, changing the way neighborhoods look to make them safer. Um, I just wanna say one last thing about COVID and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, this is a picture of the Arrowhead hotshots getting ready to do a prescribed fire. Um, and you can see they've all got their face masks on, they're trying to stand six feet apart. You know, they're, they're, they're observing social distancing in the wildland firefighting context. Um, COVID is an enormous challenge for this whole project. Um, grid hardening is a lot harder during COVID because a lot of times you have to turn the power off to, do, to install the new equipment that will make the grid safer. And there's been an enormous amount of understandable pushback to these efforts because people are sheltered in place in their homes and need the electricity to be on in their homes. So things are not on track um, for this year because of that. In addition, the impacts of PSPS, if we have to maintain some degree of shelter in place, even if just the vulnerable um, members of our community are sheltered in place, are much greater. So we need to be really thinking about how as a community we can come together and support people who need to stay um, somewhat socially isolated, even as the rest of the community opens up. Um, in addition, once fires occur, evacuation and suppression are just gonna be much more challenging. It's very hard to maintain social distance in an evacuation center. Um, and it's also incredibly difficult to do effective wildland firefighting and maintain that six foot distance. Um, the last thing I would say in conclusion is that, you know, COVID is, has obviously had a devastating impact on our economy. That is having enormous implications for the state budget. One consequence of that is that uh, funds for um, preventative fuels management have largely been a casualty of budget cuts this year. So we're, we're continuing to spend on CAL FIRE and the needs we have for fire suppression for the coming fire season. But Expenditures on that bullet point number two in my earlier on my earlier slide, you know, expenditures to reduce the consequences of fire once it begins, right? So that we don't lose whole towns. Those have really been cut. And I think in the long run, we need to find more and better, more sustainable ways to fund that work so that we are safer um, during the hot, windy, dry periods in the fall in California. 
Thanks, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, that was um, just fascinating. Um, and uh, I think let's transition into the Q&A. Uh, if you have a question, um, just to keep it uh, a bit orderly, why don't you drop in the chat um, that you have a question and I'll just um, cycle through the, uh, you know, the people as they, um, as they indicate that um, they have a question to ask. Um, maybe I'll sort of kick us off um, as people think about what they want to ask you. Um, you know, one of the, uh, the, the four main, um, uh, one of the four main kind of initiatives you, you outlined that we need to do to, um, uh, to really prevent wildfires is to stop these ignitions from taking off um, and creating that like non-combustible uh, zone around a house. I'm thinking of Mill Valley where there was a hardscaping ordinance um, that was, I don't think it, um, I think it was proposed um, that required, uh, you know, three feet around the house um, uh, to just have succulents and hardscape. Um, but it got a lot of pushback from residents um, and eventually was reversed and made, um, made I think, optional. Uh, and I, I imagine this sort of conversation is happening across sort of communities, um, you know, around our, our county as well as state. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm wondering if, like, at what level you think these restrictions need to get sort of created and enforced and, you know, whether it's lawmakers that need to make, you know, like where, um, uh, you know, how, how can we get these sort of policies passed to uh, prevent, you know, severe wildfires from happening in the future? Because it seems very much like a sort of community concern. Um, yeah, I know that's a great question, Michael. And, uh, you know, I, I, I followed closely the, the hardscape ordinance um, in Mill Valley because, you know, matters to me too. And, and I, I live in, in the community and, um, you know, it's, it's a really, I'll just say it's a really difficult problem. Um, the, the reality is that um, towns like Mill Valley, you know, were built uh, when wood was used for fuel. And you only need to go to the Mill Valley Library and look in the, his the history room and look at the historic photographs to see how little vegetation existed in the built up older parts of Mill Valley when the homes were actually built. The reason there was no wood there is because it was either cut down to burn for fuel in the local area, or it was shipped to San Francisco and burned there or turned into products. And, you know, we have, we, through the 20th century, we stopped cutting wood and we stopped burning it for fuel because we got electricity and natural gas, which is much better. Um, and and the, the trees have regrown. And so we're, we're, we've evolved gradually into a much riskier situation. And we've gotten used to that. We've gotten used to the look and feel of that kind of a community. And I, I would just say, um, you know, I, I think it ultimately the decision about how to respond to really, you know, controversial measures like that one is going to be driven by, by local decision making, but strongly influenced by the cost of home insurance. And the home insurers are getting better and better models for how to evaluate these risks. And they're starting to build things in like, is there a non-combustible zone around a house? That's a few years away from really being priced into insurance products, but it's not that far. And I, and I think, I think the, dr the driving force is going to be the cost of insurance. Great. Thanks. Uh, Margaret, um, uh, feel free to unmute and, uh, and ask your question. Okay, we were visiting, you can hear me, right? Sure can. Uh, we were visiting a winery in uh, Sonoma County and uh, the owner of the winery, uh, Dave Raffinelli, was saying to us that um, he wasn't allowed to do preventive burns of, you know, the smaller fuel because of air quality concerns and he felt that this created a bigger risk of a bigger fire. Can you comment on that? That's a great question. First of all, good choice of winery. Uh, <laughs> the, the, yeah, so the, the trade-offs between prescribed fire and wildfire are real. 
Um, and prescribed fire does create localized smoke impacts that can be significant. Historically, air districts have not, the, the air regulators, the local air regulators have not been particularly supportive of prescribed fire for that reason, and they've made it kind of burdensome to do. That is changing and changing fast in California because, because of the recognition that when you have one of these big wildfires, you're basically dosing millions of people in Northern California with very high concentrations of particulate matter. And that kills people. And it sends a ton of people to the ER with asthma attacks. So that's a, that it's taken a couple of years for that to change, but I think it is changing rapidly and it should. All right, uh, Paul. If you're referring to me, um, yep. thank you. Um, I was actually at, at two things in mind. One, we talked about the PSPS, and I'm wondering if you're encouraging or supporting the idea of having you know, wall batteries, like Tesla wall batteries, so that when there's a rolling power outages, that uh, homes are electrified uh, as opposed to just generators. Um, and that might be a, a good place to start. The second question is, should we all have five foot concrete sidewalks around our homes so that we prevent those embers from igniting our houses or the neighbor's houses? Yeah. So in terms of the, you know, backup power sources, I, I'm a big fan of batteries um, and a combination of solar with batteries, um, particularly the Tesla batteries that are very large, you know, does create a much greater ability to ride through a blackout and just sort of live your life normally when the power's out. Um, the challenge is they're still pretty expensive and many people can't afford them. And so the question is kind of how to manage that portability question. Um, but, uh, you know, compared to a universe full of people trying to maintain diesel generators, I think they're preferable. You know, the, the trouble with diesel generators, particularly as they age, is they become ignition sources if they're not maintained properly. Um, during a PSPS event in Butte County last year, there were seven fires ignited by malfunctioning diesel generators. And I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a video of a, a woman trying to put out her diesel generator with a hose while she's also trying to put out her roof and sort of switching, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, that's, you don't want to multiply that by tens of thousands. Um, Hi, and Michael. So, yeah. Hi, this is Ryan from Southern Marin Fire. I'm a fire inspector in town, uh, Southern Marin and Mill Valley. And I just want to let, the whole group know we do not allow um, any diesel generators. We only allow um, natural gas generators that are pumped in through your natural gas um, line into your house so that we're able to turn that off and there's no excess fuel on the property. Oh, thank you very much for that clarification. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, I bought that big gas generator. In terms of your question about five foot sidewalks, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, there are attractive ways to create a safer space around your home. It does not, and, and I think we need to really be careful not to kind of um, uh, get hyperbolic about the changes that are required. Um, there are, and, and, and I think, you know, the other thing to say about this is we can all do something, right? We can all make sure that there are not wood piles sitting next to our home. There are simple things you can do in terms of the connections between, many of us have fences that fence our yards. Oftentimes there's a wood gate. You can replace the wood gate with a metal gate. So you don't have a wood connection, you know, between, your, between what might be a hardened home and then this fence that's gonna burn in a fire. There are, there are lots of opportunities to make, take constructive, constructive action. Ideally, we do want to move toward, you know, you can imagine, it doesn't have to be concrete. It could be crushed granite. It could be river rocks, right? There, there are attractive options. And even three feet is better than nothing. Um, and so, and I'll tell you, this is a debate that we have in our household um, between, you know, the fire person and the person in charge of the backyard. And it's compromise is, is better than getting nowhere, um, is, is my perspective. Um, Thank you. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. All right, we have a question from 7XH8HY. <laughs> um, 
I, I, I can ask it. Um, Is that Elon Musk's kid? <laughs> uh, what do you do about non-compliant neighbors? Well, you know, I, I honestly think, you know, there, there are, I, I'm, I'm less, um, here's what I'll say. I think the right approach, and this is the approach that's taken by um, the fire departments, you know, in the community, is to work with people and help them to understand that, you know, the, the, the safety implications, the public safety implications of what they're doing. I don't think that a stick is going to work as well as a carrot. And honestly, you know, I actually have a neighbor that, that whose home, you know, will maybe burn down my house someday. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't actually blame him. You know, he's a vet. He's got on a fixed income. He's on disability. And he doesn't necessarily have the money to do the kind of large tree maintenance that would make both of our homes safer. And so from my perspective, there's a kind of public policy program problem here that needs to be solved. And it needs, and I think Marin is taking significant steps to solve it with um, the Measure C funds that hopefully will be coming to our communities, right? The most successful examples of community defense have occurred in, in wildland fire, have occurred where there's, there's money to hire people to engage house to house in a regular way with the community to help people understand what they need to do you know, and, and, and you can frame it in terms of, you know, which homes will be defended. The firefighters have a strong intuition about what is safe and what is not. And they're, you know, they, they're going to defend people, including the residents, but also themselves before they're going to try to defend property. And so, you know, there are reasons to, to, um, to, for people to take those kinds of personal actions. And increasingly, I think also insurance is going to be a reason to do it as well. Yeah, I had my insurance canceled because I was in a high fire danger fire area. And um, that was terrifying because my husband had just died and I get notification that you, you no longer have homeowners insurance. Uh, but I did find a company that would insure me, but it was it was terrifying for a, quite a long time. Um, I'm the reason I'm concerned is the people next door have uh, oleanders all the way up to my property line and it's a hillside. And it's a very steep hillside. And if that ever ignited, I'm, you know, oleanders being very combustible with so much oil, it's scary. Uh, I, you know, I contacted the, uh, the oh, county, what is it, deputy um, fire marshal. And she came out and looked and looked at the property next door to mine and just said, well, you know, gee, that's too bad. And nothing was done about wildland uh, overgrowth next to me and also this house. So I'm curious, what, what can I do? I've well, cleared my space. Hey, Michael, can I step in real quick? Of course. Hey, sure. so my name's Jessica Power. Uh, I'm a resident of Marin, but I'm also a local fire marshal in Sonoma County. Um, hi to Ryan. I used to work with Ryan down <laughs> in Southern Marin. Um, and so, um, one of the things I want to just touch on real quick is there are some great options for all of you on the call to gather your communities. And that is called a Firewise Community. It's through the National Fire Protection Association. Um, and so you can gather your neighborhood. There's some, um, some things that you have to do, numbers of people you have to get involved. But if you just Google Firewise Community, that'll pop up and it'll walk you through all the things that you need to do. And it's a great way to get your whole community involved and help out your neighbors uh, to become more informed, get involved, do the work that they need to do. Um, they also offer us a, a grant program in, it's all, unfortunately already passed for this year, um, but uh, they offer, I believe it's like $500 or so for either a neighborhood or an, a homeowner to put some money into doing some work. Um, and, and getting some of that vegetation cleared and thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The That's other, great. there was one other point. Uh, I have a solar generator and they are available, not just gas or, you know, okay. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question. Hello. Uh, uh, my question is several months ago, some fire officials came through our neighborhood to do an inspection of our property and the neighbor's properties. 
they even had a little form that uh, they filled out and gave to us, indicating uh, things that needed to be taken care of. Uh, that was, uh, oh, approximately, I I'm guessing six months ago. I've heard nothing about that subsequently. Are you familiar with the program I'm referring to? And if so, what is its current status? Um, that, that I am not familiar with the program that you're, I mean, I know that, you know, regular inspections are uh, something that all the fire departments try to do, particularly in the, um, in the SRA and, and in the higher risk areas, the state responsibility area, sorry. Um, and it's an effort that all the departments do. Um, but I would also say that, you know, in, Uh, in Marin, uh, there are weaker enforcement tools than in other parts of the state. So in some parts of the state, and, and, and this has to do with community acceptance, right? I mean, this is not, this is, this, you know, there are other parts of the state where if such an, if that kind of an inspection occurred and there were problems identified and the homeowner did not take action, the fire department has a very easy path to declaring the home nuisance, entering the property and abating the nuisance and then charging the homeowner for the costs of that nuisance abatement on their property tax bill. That's what happens in Ventura County, just to take one example. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and the power is used. Now, I think this gets to kind of the concerns that were expressed in Mill Valley about, you know, the non-combustible zone, right? People who live in Northern California are not necessarily comfortable with that kind of a very tough approach to defensible space. And, um, and so we don't have that kind of, that kind of regime. It's very difficult for the, for the County of Marin to declare a home or a property in general, a nuisance because of fire risk. And, and, and it's not, a, it's not something that's often done, if at all. And, and we take a more cooperative and sort of collaborative approach. Now, you know, for, the, I guess my view would be collaborative approaches are going to work better when there are more resources for the departments and, and the actors, the firewise communities, um, which I totally agree are a really valuable resource and a great way to bring people together and start thinking about this problem. But you know, resources matter. And so that's where Measure C is potentially so significant. And I think where we need to be thinking at the state level and, and for state lands and for, and for, and I would add, you know, the water district in, in Marin to be thinking as much hard as they can about how to create safety for communities and also safety for our firefighters because you know wildland fire you know the ecosystems we live in are evolved to burn they will burn and we want to make sure that the people that have to manage that problem when it occurs are safe and that everyone else can get out of the way in a safe and 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 reasonable way and then the firefighters can do their job and not not have to put their lives at risk um, as they've had to so many times over the last several years I had two questions about local communities and their ability to, to help here. One, one is actually uh, a question, Michael, about the opportunities that might be presented by community microgrids as a way of really reducing the uh, need to do full, full service uh, PSPS. And then the, then the second thing is, is uh, what, what role Marin com uh, clean energy, you know, the community choice aggregation uh, can be in uh, solving problems here. So those are great questions. Um, and this gets to kind of what happens during one of these safety blackouts. Um, the, 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 the Public Utility Commission in California has created very generous subsidies for microgrids, but there are big kind of regulatory hurdles that have to be overcome to actually deploy them in practice. And so um, the, the PUC is kind of working at, at the pace that the PUC can work because of the very big kind of formal processes that they have to follow um, to try to lower some of those barriers. But it's a, it's a slow process and it's not happening as fast as we need. At the same time, MCE and other community choice aggregators are kind of taking matters into their own hands. And they are, they um, actually staged a big uh, request for proposals to deploy microgrids um, with MCE funding. And, and, and they are working to do that. And I, my understanding is that they're, they're first targeting 
kind of essential facilities like fire stations to make sure that they have always on power. Um, also, uh, you know, critical infrastructure like water um, to make sure that it has, you know, the resources it needs to run through one of these longer power shutoffs. Last year, uh, MMWD was having to like shuttle big generators around between pumping stations to keep the big tanks full on the top of the hills to make sure that we all had flowing water and water pressure through the blackout. And so, you know, MCE is trying to make sure that everyone has, you know, at least at the, the infrastructure level, has the backup power that they need to, um, to keep the community safe. The next step beyond that is, you know, thinking about how we could provide, you know, backup power to a, a location like downtown Larkspur or uh, downtown uh, Mill Valley, where you could imagine keeping a local business district energized even as you know, parts of the hills above those districts are turned off during high risk conditions. And that's something that PG&E has been exploring and I think a number of other parties are interested in exploring, but there the regulatory barriers get even more formidable. Uh, and so it's a, it's a work in process. I think the technology is evolving to the point where it's doable. I know from talking to big campuses in the South Bay that they are definitely doing this, right? Like the big, uh, um, you know, where you have a single landowner, a single, a single business, they can install a microgrid and do backup power. So it's potentially doable for the big malls in Marin if they were to be impacted by a PSPS. But in general, those places tend to be in the lower risk areas, right? So the better solution there is to change the grid architecture to just keep the power on rather than having to install backup power generation. I went, wanted to, um to ask Michael, um, in some of your uh, examples about hardening, um, you actually, you know, you talked about Three Mile Island and those kind of things, which uh, get at the, the power generation system as opposed to the distribution system, which has caused a lot of the problems that we've had with the fires. So is there a real problem, do you think, uh, with power generation being also, uh, I guess, uh, dilapidating or uh, old, old, uh, architecture and, and building and then are we going to need need to basically upgrade all of our power plants as well? Well Stuart I think maybe I was unclear um, the the risk is the wires it's not the generators in general right you know that there it is it is the case that sometimes there are fires at power plants um, but there are fires at new power plants and old power plants there was a big fire at a Arizona um, stationary battery facility last year that injured a couple of firefighters um, who responded, you know, and that, that station, that, that power plant was brand new. Um, the, the big challenge are these wires that have, um, that, that, that run through all of our communities and that are potentially vulnerable to the tall trees that, that exist, that coexist in our communities. And, and the, the point I was trying to make was that um, in the past, we used to run nuclear power plants in kind of a run to failure with a run to failure approach, right? Like we just use them until they broke, we'd figure out what was wrong with them and then we'd fix it and start them up again. And that changed after Three Mile Island because it was too, it's just too dangerous to run nuclear power plants that way because the accidents are so destructive and, and hazardous to human health and well-being. And what is starting to happen in Northern California with, it, with the pg and &E system is that pg and &E is adopting a preventative maintenance approach, a kind of diagnose and fix problems before they occur approach to its poles and wires for the first time. And, and that's, a, that's very unusual in the electric power sector in general, right? This, that's not the way that poles and wires are maintained in other places either. You know, it used to be when I grew up in the Bay Area, poles and wires would fail during the first winter storm. Right, and I'm sure many of you who are longtime residents of Northern California have been through this too. The power goes out the first week in October when there's a big storm and some tree branch hits a, hits a line and knocks it down in the rain. That's not a big deal from a fire risk perspective. It only becomes a big deal when that storm, that windstorm, involves no rain and it hasn't rained since April 1st and it's 80 degrees. And, but that's the problem that the utilities have to manage to today. And it's, it's a different problem. It's a, much, it's a problem that's much less tolerant of mistakes. So that's, that's, what I would, that's the point I was trying to make is they need to shift for their poles and wires from a run to failure approach, they call it run to condition, to a preventative maintenance approach. 
and, and ideally where they're evaluating the risk of every component failing and then replacing things before there's a significant chance of a catastrophe. Thank you. I can read their question. What is the viability of goats instead of controlled fire? We live in the WUI and there are a lot of areas difficult to get to and too near housing. Yeah, you know, I mean, so prescribed fire is a great solution where it can be uh, utilized safely, but um, other types of fuel management are going to be necessary in more densely populated areas, right? There's no way that you could do, you might want to do, you might want to remove a lot of fuel um, in, in certain areas of, of Marin County that are densely populated, but you could never do it with fire. And, and even, you know, even today in many places where you might be able to use fire um, in the future, in order to get to that point, you would need to do a ton of mechan what's called mechanical thinning, um, using people you know, going out and removing vegetation in order to make it safe to use fire. So there's gonna be, you know, I think we need to use as many tools as we can. And goats are certainly one. Um, I was just hiking the other day in, ten in, in the area near my home by Tennessee Valley. And, you know, there, there, there were signs to look out for the goats. Um, and apparently they're active in the neighborhood right now, um, which is great. And, and I think we should, you know, we should embrace that. Uh, the, the, the philosophy I take with respect to fields management is we just need more and we need stable funding resources so that the firefighters can work with the communities they serve to get the work done. And, and, and we're, we're moving in the right direction and we've made some progress over the last three years but we need to keep investing in that progress to get to a safer place. My question is that it seems that putting the wires underground would have the biggest impact. Is it really too exorbitant to implement that? Well, you know, I wish it were not so, but unfortunately uh, it, 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 so undergrounding of wires costs about um, somewhere between three and $5 million per mile. And today we have about um, 10,000 miles of overhead line in very dangerous parts of Northern California in the pg e system. So we certainly cannot underground all of it, right? That's 30 to $50 uh, billion. That's too much money. Um, it would, that would, that would in essence, double electricity bills, to put that in perspective, which people couldn't afford. It may be that undergrounding is appropriate in some places and can be afforded by some homeowners, but the general policy of the PUC has been, this is too expensive and we can't ask people who don't live in high risk areas to pay for this for the people that do because it's so expensive. And so some communities have kind of banded together to pay for it. Um, and, and usually, but usually they've done it because they want a nice view, not because they're trying to manage their fire risk. So far as I know, there aren't very many communities that have taken the step of undergrounding to deal with fire risk. You Maybe did, they should. Well, you, you did say that it would be very effective, correct? Uh, it is very effective for avoiding uh, ignitions due to power lines. Yeah. There is a, I should say, there's, a, there's kind of a, uh, a halfway step, which is that if you look up at the wires over next to your, on your street, you'll notice that they're not insulated, right? They're just bare metal. And it is a, a sort of middle ground between undergrounding and, um, and doing nothing or leaving things the way they are, is to put wires on the poles that are covered with insulation. And that way, when they're knocked off the poles by a tree limb, they don't automatically start a fire. They still might, but the chance of ignition is lower. That that's called tree wire. And PG&E is actually installing a lot of tree wire in its service territory because that can be done much more, much, much, much more cheaply than, uh, than act and undergrounding, than digging up the street. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that actually answered a question that I mistakenly skipped over by Jay. So hopefully that answers your question. The questions keep on coming in. So uh, let's, um, we might have to move to rapid fire around in, in a few minutes, but let's take a couple more um, before we do that. Um, George, you had a question? Yeah, I had a simple question. Is there a plan for uh, fuel 
uh, loading uh, reduction in West Marin? Well, you know, I'll be honest, I am not as expert as I should be about the precise planning around how to spend Measure C funds. But, you know, the, the, the idea of Measure C is that it will create a sustainable funding source to really change the situation on the ground in Marin and provide sufficient resources to, to try to manage fuels, get us back into a, a more managed fuel context. So that when, when the inevitable fire occurs, right? Like there, there hasn't been a big fire in the Marin Municipal Water District since 1940. That's the last time. And so we should all be very nervous about this as residents. And, 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 and it, is, it, is, it is penny wise um, to be spending, you know, the relatively modest amounts of money that will come, that will, it will, it'll cost all of us to ensure that our communities are safer. Um, I just hope that we can do it, you know, fast enough to be ready when the fire is inevitably, when there is inevitably a big Marin fire. I don't know if you, if I've got the floor, but I'll ask my question anyway. During the last major power outage in Sausalito, one of the most difficult aspects was the loss of cellular service. Yes. Is anything being done to address that? Yes. Uh, so the PUC has jurisdiction over cellular communications and they, well, they have some jurisdiction over that. And, and but, but I, what I'll tell you is that the state is keeping much closer tabs over cellular communications because of these power blackouts and is pushing the cell companies to provide um, much greater levels of reliability, much, you know, making sure that they're supposed to have four hour backup power on their towers. And the, um, the state is pushing for bigger batteries and longer, you know, amounts of backup. They're also pushing the broadband providers. Some of you may have been impacted by broadband outages that occurred during the power shutoff because elements of the high speed internet network, internet network didn't function without power. And so, uh, and that was actually part of what put, took down some of the cell towers because the cell towers were dependent on the broadband. And so um, that's also a point where there's a lot of attention and investment occurring to try to make the system better and more resilient, more resistant to a power failure. We'll see, right? The proof will be in the pudding, um, but there's a lot of attention there. As a side note to that in Marin County, we have the Marin Emergency Radio Authority um, and I've been working on the Citizens Oversight Committee for about six years to help them rebuild it, which should be done hopefully within the next 12 to 18 months. And that'll make a more bulletproof and secure emergency system for all the first responders to work on. Uh, and hopefully it will stay safe through earthquakes and big fires. Sure. Uh, so I live up in Sonoma County and uh, I just had a question about um, whether there's any knowledge of activity going on with regard to volunteer firefighting teams. Um, part of the question that I had asked was um, during the uh, Tubbs fire that burned um, 5,000 plus structures in Sonoma County in 2017, there was simultaneous other fires going on at the same time that basically just didn't have the focus because resources were spread so thin and we were all basically forced to evacuate power outage. Uh, but curious if there was any knowledge of um, interest in volunteer firefighting teams from neighborhoods to get together to kind of protect their own homes? Um, I am not expert in that. And so I can't really speak to it. Certainly there are volunteer fire departments in Marin County, you know, the yeah. Beach, Stinson Beach, um, other places, but um, the, you know, the, what I'd say is probably the most effective change in firefighting strategy that's occurred over the last couple of years has been funding for pre-positioning of assets, right? So these days, so, so last year, for example, um, prior to the ignition that, of the Kincaid fire, there were Cal Fire assets pre-positioned in Sonoma County in the most dangerous areas so that they were ready when an ignition occurred as, a having, as opposed to having to drive there from somewhere across the state. And I think that proved really valuable. Um, it was, it was And the point that you made is also really important. There was just one fire, right? 
during the Napa Sonoma fire siege, mutual aid essentially broke down, right? I mean, there, there, it was the, the fire services were overwhelmed by the number of ignitions and the number of simultaneous fires out of control all over two counties. And, you know, avoiding that outcome is really important in, in terms of success. And a similar problem occurred, you know, in Southern California uh, for the Woolsey fire. There was a fire to the north of the Woolsey fire where most of the Southern California air assets were devoted and the Woolsey fire got away. Um, and cause enormous destruction and, and loss of, uh, of life and property as a result. So, you know, it, it's, it's trying to keep, you know, and that's where public safety power shutoffs may be a really like, useful tool because it's gonna reduce the total number of ignitions, hopefully to zero, but if not to zero, at least maybe to a much smaller number so that the firefighters on the ground can focus their efforts. Another really important thing a big difference in strategy, which is going to be more challenging because of COVID, is evacuation, right? So, so large parts of Sonoma County were evacuated in advance of kind of a very direct threat from the Kincaid fire. You may remember that the, there was an evacuation order for essentially all of Sonoma County to the beach um, west of 101 during the, the, the worst part of the Kincaid fire. And that was intentional so that the firefighters could focus on fighting fire and suppress suppression efforts rather than having to focus on evacuation and getting residents out of their homes, which was an enormous concern during the 2017 and 2018 fires. Hey, Paul. Um, this is Jessica Power again. Oh, uh, and Jessica, I was going to add on, thank you for sharing the FireWise communities. That, that did partially answer my question. I'll look into that for our neighborhood. Well, there's also another program in Santa Rosa um, and many communities in uh, Sonoma called uh, COPE, and it's Citizens Organized Prepared for, for Emergencies. Uh, your Santa Rosa Fire Department hosts uh, local trainings. I think most of it is online these days, uh, but you can get involved with that. That's another way to get your community involved. If you're looking specifically for yourself to get involved as a volunteer, there's also lots of opportunities for that as well. Um, and like Michael talked about, the pre-positioning funds were something that the California Fire Chiefs Association and several others fought really hard for, and I believe it's $25 million the last three years that have been set aside. Part of the reason that that is so successful is that the resource orders have to go through the state, and so until they get people in to take all of the calls and put those orders in and get people on the road, that's a little bit delayed in the sense that um, you can only take so many calls at once. So that pre-positioning and having those resources there for local dispatchers to use instead of having to go through the state is a big help as well. Thank you. You're welcome. What was the, the name of COPE again? What does this stand for? Uh, Citizens Organized to Prepare for Emergencies. And it's available in almost every community in Sonoma County. In Marin, it's called Get Ready. Yeah. Ah, Get Ready Marin. It's, a, it's essentially the same program with different names. Right. Thanks so much, Jessica. Um, I think there's probably a question that maybe you or the gentleman, I didn't catch his name earlier, or the other fire official could, could speak to around whether generators run by pro propane will be allowed. I don't know if Ryan's still on. Um, we don't have any regulations no. on what type of uh, generators you're allowed to use. Just contact your local fire department. They'll be able to assist you with that process. Yeah, in Southern Marin, we only allow the natural gas connection. But um, that's for Southern Marin and I believe Mill Valley, but I'm not sure about the other areas. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, William, I think your question was already answered around undergrounding. Um, if you're still on. Yeah, it, it, it was answered in part. Uh, my question was specifically under undergrounding of residential power lines as opposed to power lines that might be um, uh, in, in open spaces. Yeah. Uh, uh, I live in Ross where there's a, a move and I think that's also true of other communities, Belvedere, Tiburon, probably Mill Valley to underground certain facilities and there, the homeowners bear the expense. Uh, it's not a it's not a public program. And my question is: Is it, in terms of a of a risk benefit uh, uh, analysis, is it is it really worth it? I mean, how much good does 
undergrounding of utilities in residential communities as opposed to open spaces do? Well, I think there's evidence to suggest that undergrounding can really increase, uh, or, or sorry, lower the risk of um, ignition from fire. You know, the challenge with undergrounding is that if the earth moves and your power line is in the street, it can be hard to fix. Um, and that is the, that's the trade-off in places like Northern California, where the earth does sometimes move. Um, so the, you know, the, the, there can be reliability trade-offs in terms of recovery after an earthquake, but it, I don't think there's any question that having underground power lines reduces your risk of fire um, caused by overhead power lines being hit by trees. Um, it, it, it definitely does, um, but it's very expensive. And, and, and to do it at you know, sufficient scale, and this, this also gets to kind of the, the herd immunity point I was making in the talk, you know, it could be that um, you know, one neighborhood does this or one street does this, but if all the streets don't do it, or if the neighboring community doesn't do it, it may not actually provide a lot of protection because it'll need, you know, if the fire that starts in San Anselmo is gonna impact Ross, right? And just like the fire that starts in Sausalito could impact uh, where I live in Tennessee Valley. Um, and, and so we really need to, you know, think about these actions and interventions at as large a scale as we can, because fire, especially the fires we've experienced over the last couple of years, operate at very large scale. The embers in the Kincaid fire, in the Tubbs fire, in the Camp fire, there were embers blowing a mile ahead of the fire front and landing and igniting spot fires. So that's the kind of problem we need to manage in Marin. And I think undergrounding you know, can be a solution, but we need to realize that if we spend the money that way, we may not want to spend it another way. And, and there may be more cost-effective interventions. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is, what is the GGNRA doing in areas where there are private homes adjacent to the GGNRA? You know, that's a great question. Um, I do not know the answer. I do know that in general, the federal fuels management budget is not great. <laughs> Um, and uh, the federal government has a hard time funding and affording fuels management, but the exception can be in national parks. Um, I, but I do not know, you know, the, the, probably the most significant example of this are the eucalyptus groves above Sausalito and Tam Valley, where we did have a fire. Um, I'll never forget this, the, the eucalyptus leaves charred and sort of bubbling, pirouetting out of the sky into my backyard from the fire that occurred in, I think it was 2003. Um, but the, you know, there are significant fire risks in the GGNRA. Um, I am not sure about the funding situation to manage them. Does anyone, would, would Southern Marine Fire have an answer to that? Yeah, well, uh, we had a a tax measure passed uh, a few years ago, Measure U. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but um, I mean, in our district, we have a certain amount of funding uh, to help uh, cities and anyone with a lot of open space um, clear the hazards out of those areas. So that's pretty much what we're doing. Um, I'm not sure about with this Measure C funding, how much of the funding will go towards uh, vegetation clearing. Um, I, I can get you a better answer uh, if you give me your contact information at a different time. Okay. All right. Hey, Ryan. Uh, the other thing that yes. would help was just to not be fined if you do any work on your, you know. I know our neighbors have done yeah. a lot to clear underbrush and do that sort of thing that's permitted not you know, cutting trees or doing anything, but just to clear out underneath. So I know a lot of those areas, if you give, if you ask them if you want to do clearing, they are, they're happy to give you permission. Okay, I'll try it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I just want to add that. Uh, my name is Jesse Figoni. I'm the Vegetation Management Specialist for Southern Marine Fire Protection District. Um, 
uh, we are actively um, working with GGNRA and, uh, you know, going through the right process and procedures to actually um, create defensible space um, for those homes, uh, especially up on uh, Wolfback Ridge and uh, potentially doing some fuel reduction work uh, along Highway uh, 101. So just wanted to give you some heads up. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nitza? Yeah, actually, good timing, because Jesse is um, our partner in our Firewise neighborhood. So I want to put a plug in for the Firewise neighborhoods. We've got 60 of them in Marin County. If you're not part of one, start one. Fire department's great, and they're easy to work with, and it helps. Um, but my specific question is, uh, and I don't know, Michael, if you can talk to this, what's the latest science about hardening siding. Uh, we live in a home that's got 60 year old, you know, cedar sh uh, shingles. And there's a, there are a bunch of coating companies out there. And we don't know what to do with that. We have done this, the five foot, you know, perimeter, mm -hmm. but the siding I'm concerned about. I think it's reasonable to be concerned about cedar, sh cedar shingle siding on a home. Um, what I would say is the, the best science that's done on kind of home hardening and home combustion is from an organization called IBHS. Mm -hmm. And the place to look is there for understanding. Uh, and that's a, that's a research organization that's funded by the insurance industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they basically have like a wind tunnel where they build houses and then try to burn them down with embers. Um, and there's a lot of information on their website and I would, that's the place that I would start to find out um, unless some of the fire departments have an answer there. Well. Yeah, I've, I've worked with IBHS before. I'm actually working with uh, Dan Gorham right now uh, to do some vegetation testing. But um, as far as the, the coverings or um, coatings, there isn't enough um, testing done for that, especially with the, um, the durability of the, the coatings as far as them lasting more than a year or so uh, mm -hmm. and having the same type of fire rating. They know they work pretty well after a day of, uh, you know, time going by, but um, the testing I don't believe is out there yet to approve these uh, coatings yet. Does tree wire suffer from electrical erosion similar to underground wire casing? Uh, I'm going to say that that is beyond my, uh, my skill set to answer competently. So I'm, uh, I'm going I'm to plead ignorance on that one. All right. Um, I just, uh, before we close things out, I just wanted to see if any of the, the fire officials who are on wanted to give uh, other plugs or additional advice for, um, Great. Uh, you know, for, for the audience. I thought your contributions have been really helpful and I think we're all going to walk away with uh, a good set of resources and, and knowledge about, you know, the wildfire um, prevention options here in Marin. But yeah, if there's yeah, anything. I can... Sure. I'd like to add something about the five foot zone around the house. Um, I know it, it did scare a lot of people in uh, Marin or Mill Valley specifically uh, saying that we are requiring that five foot zone. And uh, the zone is really there to, um, uh, basically make sure that it's clear of any combustible vegetation, which mainly means uh, dead brush. Um, we're trying to get rid of the dead material. Even, I mean, we want it up to 100 feet, but the most important area is that five foot zone and um, specifically the grounding of uh, making sure there is no bark on the ground around that five foot zone. and. I mean, that's the big thing. If it's dirt um, or rock, um, anything else, but mainly not dry dead wood, uh, that's the only thing we're really trying to get out of that area and to make sure you don't have any of the fire prone plants um, in that designated area, which is already required uh, by our ordinance to be removed within 30 feet of your structure anyway. From a local perspective, just kind of want to uh, enforce um, you know, work with your neighbors, do what you can do, uh, the defensible space and the, the little group I was in before I was talking about defensible space and home hardening are really important. Uh, we used to sort of think in the fire service that, 
Um, just the defensible space was important. We're discovering that that's, that's not the case, that home hardening is there. I heard a couple of people talk about insurance issues. Um, there is an innovative company out there that is doing wildfire modeling to get you home insurance if you live inside the wildland urban interface uh, and have had troubles with your insurance. Um, so, uh, so look out for that. Um, it, the insurance issue is, is quite complicated and it is an old outdated antiquated system in my personal opinion. So um, I hope that you can find some solutions. Um, and kudos to all of you for being involved. We don't see that um, from a, a ton of people in our community sometimes. Um, so kudos to being involved. Thank you. Um, well, let's please, uh, I'll take a moment to thank Michael for his, his time again tonight. I think it was just a, a fascinating talk and uh, I loved all of your questions. So su super engaging Q&A. So. Thanks everyone for turning out and especially to the, the, the firefighters for coming to share your wisdom as well. I really learned from you both and I really appreciate your time after hours. So thank you. Thanks everyone too for your great questions. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I know I walked in thinking a lot about just my personal responsibility and sort of walked away thinking about how important it is and kind of a responsibility of the whole community to uh, effectively reduce wildfires. So that was certainly important for me and something that I'll, I'll carry with me. Um, if you uh, haven't, please, please join uh, our Stanford Club of Marin Facebook group. Um, we send uh, notices out for uh, upcoming events. Um, and if you have ideas for future talks that you'd like to see or uh, future events, or if you wish to volunteer, um, feel free to reach out directly to me, Cody, or any of the other board members. Um, we're happy to um, field those ideas and um, suggestions. Thank you for uh, for joining us tonight, and uh, you know, hope to see you again at an upcoming event.